Well, thanks a lot. Um, well, I just wanted to say thanks to Paolo for this opportunity to comment on a piece of research that I think is very timely and very thought-provoking, um, especially given sort of the prominence of these transparency discussions in international development cooperation. I thought I'd structure my remarks in three parts, just say something quickly about what I um, liked and sort of took away from this research, um, make a bit of an argument about how I think it fits within a, a sort of broader historical narrative about the evolution of, um, of budget institutions, and then bring it back to this question of the policy implications. Um, so first, what I really liked were um, the fact that you've been able to identify what I thought was a very convincing set of sort of drivers of um, increased fiscal transparency in the countries you looked at. Um, so the political transitions, fiscal crises, um, major corruption scandals, and um, external influences. And also that you started suggesting, although my sense is that you'd qualify that with the need for further research, that sort of what, what the drivers of transparency were also sort of determines whether or not transparency is sort of linked to participation and, and accountability. Um, and as sort of a development practitioner, I guess I'm particularly interested in that sort of a it's sort of an outcome of an accountability struggle, if you will. And in some ways isn't so controversial in itself because the budget's already reflecting sort of an agreement that's been reached in principle. And what it does is it sort of clarifies the rules ambiguity manages expectations, but it's something that sort of both executive and parliament probably see a value in because it helps to enforce an agreement that's already been sort of reached in a way. Um, so I think we go in some ways from there to this kind of idea of parliamentary approval of a budget sort of becoming almost like one of the most important sort of symbols of state legitimacy. And it sort of takes on a life of its own over the course of the century. So that even in countries where the budget isn't really a contract, where it's not really a bargain between different interest groups, um, the ritual of budget approval and the budgeting process um, sort of becomes something that the governments aspire to, to have. Um, I think I spoke to a friend of mine about this recently, who sort of used the example of um, Banda in Malawi, who'd sort of every year present the budget to Parliament, was quite open about the fact that um, that the budget was being used to fund sort of presidential jets and, and security forces, um, and there was no real accountability or questioning of those decisions there, but it was still kind of a transparent, in theory, process. Um, so I think we've had that kind, those kind of, forces at play, but also then the international communities, I think, desire to use budget transparency as a proxy for sort of inclusive politics, because in some ways it's, well, it's a much easier thing to, mar to measure than participation and accountability. So I think we've also seen sort of budget support donors, policy dialogue between donors and, and country governments focus very much on, on transparency for lack of any other tool with which to get at this sort of complicated um, interrelationship between transparency, accountability and, um, and participation. And that this has had, or it can have perverse incentives as well and sort of create, I guess, a divergence between sort of your formal budget process and the way the budget's actually being spent. Um, so today, I think we still, th I think today we think of, of budget transparency, though, as a potential catalyst for participation and accountability. We see it as something that could still open up the space for more dialogue, more participation, and eventually accountability. But in some ways, that's almost a reversal from the way I think it's been conceptualized historically as sort of an outcome of an accountability struggle. Um, so I guess in the interest of being sort of almost purposely a bit provocative, um, my question for Paolo is sort of, do you think, given these case studies and the historical narrative, is it, 
do we have enough evidence to suggest that transparency in itself is a good thing? Um, and I'd probably, and I think you kind of do imply that in your conclusion to some extent of, of uh, this research. I'd probably still say, I think, personally think transparency is a good thing because even if it's, and I think it's something that you have to take a long-term perspective on. Um, so even if it's not really leading to greater participation in the short term, hopefully it's opening up the space so that when you see some of these other factors coming into play, crisis, fiscal crises or political transitions, um, hopefully that's already providing sort of more fertile ground um, for those discussions and for, um, for that to play out. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd leave it there with that Thank you question. Thank you very much, um, and particularly for taking up the invitation to be provocative. I think Paolo can think about whether he needs to reverse the funnel or <laughs> go the opposite way through the funnel while we hand over to Joachim to uh, offer some further discussion comments. <coughs>